You guys know him, you love him, and we cannot thank him enough. Traveling all the way from Sweden, right? Zurich, I'm sorry, Zurich, Switzerland. It's one of those European countries. America, yeah. Ivor Cummins. Thanks, Well, hello everyone. I'm delighted to be back from crazy Europe. I'm delighted to make the long trip to be here with you guys. And I'm going to go through, well, an engineering guide to chronic disease avoidance. I won't be really hardcore keto and all that. I'll go through the primary drivers of modern chronic disease and give a picture of that for all of you, hopefully. So, uh, first disclosure, I am fully funded by David Bobbitt, an Irish entrepreneur who runs one of Ireland's largest corporations. And he set up the Irish Heart Disease Awareness uh, Charity after he had a personal experience with uh, severe heart disease that was undiagnosed. So this is all philanthropy, and I will be mentioning a really incredible test to analyze how much heart disease you actually have, a five-minute scan, but we have no connections to the imaging industry. There's no financial interest here. So we know that cholesterol has been focused on for many decades, and I've studied it in great depth over the past few years. And it's really a very much less important thing than other much more important processes that occur in the body that lead to disease. And one thing that has frustrated me over the years is how much the cholesterol researchers for many decades have peered at cholesterol in every aspect, and they can't seem to see that there are much more important things, things that actually cause cholesterol to be a problem. They just can't seem to get out of their fishbowl. So I have a little bit of footage here, I hope you'll enjoy, rare footage showing teams of cholesterol researchers trying to see the real deal, trying to get their hands on it. So as you can see, it's quite a challenge for these guys uh, when they're living in their cholesterol world. But anyway, that was just a bit of humor. So part one, I'm going to go into, if you don't measure it, you don't get fixed. And this is very important in engineering problem solving on complex problems. Most complex problems are multifactorial, certainly heart disease is, but you need to measure properly to be looking at the right things, otherwise you'll be lost. And I'm gonna introduce you to Pareto. So Pareto was a very great figure in the last century, and he recognized that 20% of your effort, if you put it in the right place, would get you 80% of your results. And likewise, you could spend 80% of your effort on the wrong things and get back only 20%. So it's a very important principle, and we're gonna come back to this guy shortly. I would also say that 20% of the root causes for a multifactorial issue account for 80% of the potential issue resolution. So you need to be really careful to work on the top Pareto's, the biggest bang for the buck things in any disease process. I'm gonna give a story here that touches on Pareto, and that's my uh, boss, uh, David Bobbitt. He's CEO and owner of H&K International. 52 years old, a few years ago, slim, fit, non-smoker, very focused on health, jogging, running four times a week, described by his doctors as bulletproof. And he has six children, so very focused on health. He got around 15 executive medicals over the years. All his bloods were good, treadmill tests, ECGs, all good. Fittest, 10% for his age, bulletproof. But then he was lucky enough to get a calcium scan in the US by chance. And the calcium scan is a great example of Pareto because the calcium scan for a five minute quick scan gives an enormous amount of information back, right? So that's Pareto principle, huge bang for the buck. The calcium scan, as it always does, told the truth. He had a 906 score, worst 1% for his age for heart disease. The Framingham risk measures said he was a 4 or 5% chance. He was actually a 50 to 75% chance of a major heart event in the following 10 years. So this calcification scan supersedes all tests. 
He got really angry and had to go in for an operation to check, and three out of four coronary arteries were mostly blocked. Disaster. And the solution actually was not surgery in his case. The solution was some meds and lifestyle fixes were the dominant solution for him. He took six months off his huge business, delegated, and studied this intensively, traveled around the world. He's a really intense guy, trust me. He discovered that he was actually diabetic all along, undiagnosed. They never caught his diabetes. After a meal, his blood sugar was going up 300, 350 milligrams, right? So he's a hugely type 2 diabetic. But he also discovered that heart disease is resolvable even when you have huge levels of it. The progression of atherosclerosis can be stopped if you do the right things. So there's total hope here. And he found out that nutritional interventions are the most powerful. They are the real things to fix the problem. So he resolved his disease process. His calcification has increased very little, only a few percent per year over the last six years. He has effectively brought his risk down to someone who had a low score in the first place. Huge achievement. He founded the charity, Irish Heart Disease Awareness, and he funded for a couple of million dollars the Widowmaker movie, which tells the story of this amazing scan and how it's been suppressed for decades. And we can send a link to that later. You can watch it for free. All philanthropy. So what is this amazing scan, the CAC score from the CT scan of the heart? Well, on the left there, you can see my buddy and co-author, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, and he has zero calcium at the age of 54. And that's being called now a warranty. Your death rates from all causes are so low in the following 15 years if you get a zero score in middle age. It's a human warranty. Not 100% safe, but very low rates. On the right, then, is a person in a much worse situation. They might have a score of five or 600. And the calcification scan simply sees the calcium in the main coronary arteries. And years and years of inflammatory disease that cause atherosclerosis, your body recruits calcium to stabilize the weak and burning arteries. And the calcium that builds up becomes the canary in the coal mine that tells you how sick you really are. And that's why it predicts death and heart attacks to such an amazing degree. I'll give you one sample here from the Cardiology Imaging Journal. A zero score in middle age, you can see around a one, one and a half percent 10 year event rate for cardiac events. That's extremely low. A zero doesn't mean you're absolutely bulletproof. It means your rates will be extremely low. You're the healthiest people on the planet. A very high score like David's predicts 37% heart events in the following 10 years. So now you're seeing maybe a 25 times worse uh, prognosis by having a high score. If you have high blood pressure or some of these other risk factors, you might be 2x or twice as likely. Calcification blows those away. This is a good view in a 50,000 person study. You'll see that zero risk factors on the left, one, two, or more than three risk factors. The red line shows that the risk of all cause mortality increases steadily. Not hugely, but steadily, and that makes sense. More risk factors, more mortality. But notice the bars. Those bars are the calcification results for the people. And you'll see that it blows away the risk factors. A zero risk factor person with a high score is nearly as badly off as a three or more risk factors person with a high score. It's the calcification result that predicts the future properly, right? Way beyond the risk factors. And what poorly predicts atherosclerosis severity? So atherosclerosis, the inflammatory disease of your arterial wall that leads to heart attacks, what poorly predicts it? Well, here we see the CAC, which is atherosclerosis extent, getting worse as we move across the bottom, from low CAC all the way to super high. And we've plotted LDL from this study against it. And you can see that LDL, as it rises, gently predicts higher calcification. But then look at the right-hand side. The LDL being lower lines up with the worst diseased folks. So that's not an engineering test, LDL. Because you can have one guy with a certain LDL and another guy with the same LDL. One has got minimal disease and one has got maximal, dreadful disease. So how do you know which guy you are? 
the LDL can't tell you, and that's a challenge. However, if you look at blood pressure and diabetes extent, they continuously predict higher calcification all the way up, even exponentially for diabetes. These are good engineering measures. These are dependable and dose response. This is what engineers would use. But the other important point is blood pressure and diabetes are essentially manifestations of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, which is one of the major true causes of heart disease. And that's why they predict so consistently. And following the Pareto principle, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance would be the things we'd have focused on for the last 50 years because they're the big hitters, right? They're the top things that give you most of the results in solving the problem. So part two, we'll go through what we call the primary Pareto's. We take all the factors and we stack them in order of importance when we're solving engineering problems. We can't afford to work on the crappy Pareto's. We don't have the resources or the time. So this picture shows a room and there's something missing from the room. And we see the reporters, researchers, and all the people in the media over the past decades. And they're focusing on cholesterol mainly. And they're talking about healthy whole grains, and fat is bad, and salt is bad, and exercise is good, and meat might give you cancer. All of this stuff is what they're focusing on. But what's missing from the room? Well, the elephant is missing from the room. Hyperinsulinemic syndrome is vastly more important than any of those individual things, but it's not getting discussed in the mass media, but it's where all the action is. And another thing missing from the room, and the reason why all of this is happening is, no one's honoring Pareto and pulling out the big factors, right, and working on those, and when you've done those, you can work back to the little guys. So I'll show you one study that illustrates this. A mathematical and medical team analyzed the past 50 years of trials, got all the data together, and began to look at what are the big Pareto items? What are the big things that cause heart disease that we could tackle? And what they saw was the top one, and they called it out in the paper, was hyperinsulin or insulin resistance. If you normalize that reasonably in young people, you get a 42% reduction in cardiac events over the following decades. That's a pretty huge reduction, right? But what they didn't realize and call out, unfortunately, is that systolic blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, and BMI to an extent are all intimately connected into the hyperinsulin system. So you could really look at this whole block of stuff and all those numbers as one big thing to go after, right? Now, if you did that, you'd certainly be honoring Pareto because you'd have a massive thing to go after that's causing most of your problem. However, we've seen for decades most of the focus on LDL cholesterol, right? And you can see it only gets a 16 there from the mathematical analysis. And I'd reduce that to half because LDL also gets predictive power from the disturbance in your insulin system. So it kind of hitches a ride. So it really is a very small Pareto item. But what if you focused on that remorselessly for decades and everyone knew their cholesterol and you put all your focus there? Who would you be following? Maybe that guy, right? Well, that's the way I view it. It doesn't make any engineering sense to me. So the Pareto game, let's look at a couple more factors and see if we can pick the big ones. So the factor there, hypertension history, diastolic blood pressure, the lower number in your blood pressure, and we've got total cholesterol being high, LDL being high. And we're going to look at the risk ratios from this study of people who had repeat heart attacks. What mattered to get a repeat heart attack? And what we see is that hypertension, diastolic, okay, they're approaching the 2x or double your risk, which is a minimum you should expect, and they're highly significant statistically. They're not noise. But look at high cholesterol and high LDL. They've got very weak risk multipliers, and they're not even significant, really, in the statistical analysis. So Pareto wouldn't, wouldn't wipe the floor with them. But it gets more interesting. In the multivariate analysis, and this is where they analyze what factors depend on other ones and what ones are truly independent drivers 
So you, you sort out the wheat from the chaff. And here, when they did the analysis, total and LDL dropped away to nothing. They had almost no value, right? They didn't even show the LDL data, but I know from the, oh, the data they did show that LDL would have been down with cholesterol. Insulin, do people think insulin reached a 2x? Maybe even a little higher in this great analysis? Well, sure it did. 6.7x for insulin. It stood head and shoulders above everything else. And no one's measuring insulin. I'm sure you guys know. It's hard to even get the measurement done, which is insane. Now, I'm sure Pareto would look at this and say, duh. I mean, <laughs> this isn't even a hard game, guys. I mean, he was born and died long before insulin. But if he saw this, he'd, he'd roll in his grave, you know? This is a no-brainer. One last one, hyperinsulinemic syndrome, the metabolic syndrome is broader than you think. And this is a great paper because the guys who got together to, to do this analysis knew what I'm saying to you, that metabolic syndrome, hyperinsulinemic syndrome was huge in many diseases. So they looked and got all the metabolic syndrome papers and then they selected out the ones where insulin was actually measured so they could analyze it. So how did insulin relate to the myriad diseases in all of these papers, many different modern chronic diseases? Well, this is what happened. In 67 out of 70 studies, insulin stood out as being higher in the people who got the disease versus the people who didn't. And I'll let you for a moment read that list. That's a lot of modern chronic disease intimately tied to insulin. And I can tell you, if you measured LDL in those, you wouldn't see Jack. Right? You'd hardly see much even for the cardiovascular, never mind the rest. And what really annoys me is, given what I told you, that the latest data I got last week is that 65% approximately of US adults over 45 are now pre-diabetic or diabetic. Now, pre-diabetic, diabetic, hyperinsulinemic, insulin resistant, diabetes in situ, you can call it what you like. But calling it different things confuses the picture. It's all the same type of pathology, and two-thirds of people have it, which is insane. Myself and Dr. Gerber, if you did proper insulin testing and looked deeper, we reckon 75 or 80 percent would probably have some form of this dysfunction. And this dysfunction is known to be the biggest driver of cardiovascular disease and many other diseases. And no one's measuring insulin. So this is how I feel when I think about this. I'm in a vendetta kind of mood. This photo was taken from a conference in Hungary a couple of months ago. And uh, very nice of Fahad from Keto Geeks. I'm sure you know him. He's good with the Photoshop. So he enhanced the photo to make it even more reflect my state of mind. <laughs> Thanks, Fahad, <laughs> for putting that out on Twitter. So uh, no, excellent, bit of fun. So part three, the primary causes. So we've got to cover the causes. And here I'll have to give a shout out to Gabor Ordosi, a molecular biologist in Hungary. I kind of have a man crush on him. For when Gabor's watching this, I'll embarrass him. But no, Gabor has sent me thousands of papers and we debated and argued all through 2016, 17 on what are the real roots of the root of how you get to be hyperinsulinemic and dysfunctional and diseased. So we've got on YouTube three interviews I did with him in Budapest a few weeks ago. Uh, they're well worth watching, I think. The question is, have you got safe fat or sick fat? Your adipose tissue, your adipocytes, your fat cells are a crucial juncture that either keep you healthy or allow you to slide into systemic hyperinsulinemia and all the diseases that go with it. So safe fat on the top there, subcutaneous adipose tissue all around your body, thighs, buttocks, outside your body, safe storage, not inflamed, healthy. And you can have sick fat, primarily visceral fat, in between your organs, behind your muscle wall. You know, that can become inflamed, a lot of immune system attack, and that is a trigger for hyperinsulinemia, a huge one. You can find out with an MRI how you're doing. Around the outside of your torso there, you can see safe subcutaneous. And in the center, the visceral tissue in around your organs. That's a dead giveaway for serious dysfunction in your body. 
But there's four types of people, and I'd like to go through them briefly here and maybe think, which one are you? Top left is metabolically healthy normal weight, and this is the person everyone wants to be. They've got moderate amounts of safe fat, subcutaneous, and that fat protects them when they occasionally eat bad food or excessive food. It absorbs the energy, releases it gently later. The fat's working well, and it acts as a shield for the liver. No bullets get through to the liver. And these people are insulin sensitive and very low risk for disease. Now we have an interesting group, the metabolically obese normal weight. They're apparently normal weight, they're not particularly fat, but they're metabolically obese. They have got inflammation in their fat tissue, shown by the red dots, and they've built up visceral adipose tissue in and around their organs. And when they eat the bad food, the bullets get through to the liver because the fat cross talks to the liver in myriad ways, and when this system weakens, your liver begins to feel the heat and your pancreas. They are insulin resistant and very high risk for disease. The metabolically unhealthy obese are kind of classic. They're metabolically unhealthy, they have huge amounts of subcutaneous, right? They're insulin resistant, they have visceral adipose tissue, and they're at high risk but at least most people who are really large know they've probably got risk. You know, there's no illusions. That said, there are the metabolically healthy obese, a small percentage, very interesting guys, and they have been able to create huge amounts of subcutaneous adipose tissue that's remained non-inflamed and safe and not too much visceral. And they've had an ability to create a lot of healthy fat, and they are still protected from bad food and excessive food. Now, at some point down the line, they'll flip into a less favorable uh, metabolism, but still, they exist to prove that it's not the obesity that's the problem. It's the health of the fat tissue. Now, I'm going to go back to the metabolically health or obese normal weight, or TOFIs. These are a very important group, and myself and David Bobbitt, my, my boss, are very focused on these people who are not fat, don't smoke, don't appear to have a problem by the orthodox medical system, but they're the ones who drop dead in their 50s of heart attacks, and people say, he didn't smoke, wasn't fat. They're the mystery that's not really a mystery that we particularly want to help save. And by lustic figures, there may be 50 million US adults in this group, and countless millions more around the world. You know, And this is an unacceptable situation. But we've got to look at why. Why does the fat tissue go bad? What are the earliest steps that lead you into being in one of those boxes, a bad box? And it actually goes back to the gut. The gut is ground zero for where the dysfunction really starts at the earliest stages. I'm not talking about microbiome. I know that's very trendy, and there's all kinds of microbiome products popping up. But myself and Gabor believe it's more the hormonal signaling milieu in the gut. There are many hormones released depending on what you eat. They talk to the brain, the liver, the pancreas, the adipose tissue, and they control how food is managed in your body. And that's what's crucial for us, rather than the microbiome per se. So I'll bring you on a quick tour through your stomach. Um, you see your stomach up the top there, and then you've got your small intestine, the duodenum up high, and the ileum down lower in the brown tube. You can see the K cells that release GIP hormone, which is crucially important, and they're located up high in your small intestine. The food kind of gets to them first. They cause insulin release and adipose storage. So GIP speaks to your adipocytes, to your bone, and to insulin and pancreatic release of insulin. So think of these as high sugar cells they get everything going to fat storage and high insulin. Down lower in your ileum, down lower in the pipe, when the food makes its way down there, you've got the L cells, and they release GLP-1, a very beneficial hormone, and PYY. And these hormones promote pancreatic function and enhance the pancreas, and they promote satiety through connections to the brain. So consider these L cells and these hormones as the good ones. There's no good and bad, really, but think of them as the good ones. What happens when you eat bad food? And bad food, I put some pictures there. You know, refined carb, carby junk, right? 
that, and carb mixed with fat. That's really bad. What happens when you put that in, down the hatch? Well, you get an explosive release of GIP from the K cells, right? A huge release. And your insulin will rocket, and your adipose storage will be geared to store fat. But this kind of food doesn't tend to travel right down to the ileum very well and make a big bang down lower. So you actually don't get a lot of um, enhanced release of GLP-1 or PYY, which you can think of as the good hormones. So you've got a double whammy there in a bad way. You've got too much of one that you don't want and too little of another that you do want. So the ratio is really out of whack. This is important. Now, what happens if you put in good food? And yeah, it's going to be kind of keto type food, right? Some pictures there. You put good food down the hatch instead. Well, now you're not going to provoke K cells and GIP so much at all. And you're going to have lower insulin and lower storage, which is great. And the good foods tend to travel more down the intestine. And they do excite the L cells, GLP and PYY. So you've got a double whammy again, but now it's a good double whammy. You've got more of the good and less of the bad. That's a route to systemic metabolic health. So I've shown you that system now with the transit of food, but what can surgery outcomes tell us? Well, there's a surgery called rouen oui gastric bypass, which is the most effective one. And you'll see there that they do close the stomach down a bit, but they also bypass the uh, upper small intestine, they bypass the K cells, and they direct the food straight to where the L cells are. And you might figure, well, this is going to be a good thing because you're not provoking GIP, the negative hormone, and you are provoking GLP-1 and PYY, the good hormones. And that's what happens. Blood glucose re control returns to these people within days, way before any significant weight loss. The diabetic GIP to GLP-1 and PYY signaling that was bad is actually reverse. Signaling is restored, they get really big benefits super quick. So it's an illustration of this. Surgery does the trick, but what can diet do? Do you need to cut up your stomach, a healthy organ, to get this? No, you don't. Here's a actually mostly plant-based, not vegetarian, but plant-heavy pair of paleo diets they tested. And you can see there that the control diet, standard diet, you get a huge surge of GIP in the hour or two after you eat that crap diet. But the two paleo diets, the GIP release is very low. That's fantastic. That's surgery level response without the surgery. And the PYY, which is the satiety hormone, the good one from the right hand side, you can see the control diet doesn't bring it up at all. But hey, presto, the two paleotype diets raise PYY and satiety and all the good stuff excellently. So essentially, they make these important hormones all switch to the right balance, just with diet. And what they found in these studies was it's the cellular structure of the food that's critical. So certain types of processing, particularly of carbohydrate-type foods, plant foods, creates the really bad effect. So processing is really important. Got this picture from the web last night, processing and refining starch. Got a picture from Alibaba there. Lots of equipment made for this purpose. And you can see they turned these resistant starch tubers down into what you see at the bottom. And that's where the evil comes in. And I'm going to show you some refined mice now. You know, Not those dirty, scuttery little creatures you see in the lab. These are refined guys. And what they did with these refined mice was they refined their food for them. So on the left, you see, on the standard chow pellets, their liver weight and their body weight didn't go up much at all. A perfect, healthy mouse eating its natural carby chow. But when they fed them sugar and fat, which they call the Western diet, or sugar and even more fat, the high-fat diet, right, they blew up. Disaster, right? Disaster. But what happened when they ground up each diet, just mechanically ground it into powdery form? Would the standard chow, which was so healthy, just by grinding it up, cause the mouse to get a little worse, a little more like the high-fat sugar diets? You're damn right it did. 
it became as bad as the high sugar and fat diets in these ad-lib feeding studies. So the structure of those plant-based carbohydrates is crucial. If you grind them up, you turn them into super fuel that leads you to super disease. Again, the structure of the food this team called out was key, the mechanical structure of the cells. Last one, and it's on humans. They looked, and as you can see, white bread, standard wheat bread versus glucan-added rye bread, which is a little better, more fiber, versus whole kernel rye bread, hardly processed. You get much lower GIP with the less processed breads and lower insulin accordingly. But when they analyzed what was the crucial factor between these breads, was it the fiber we all hear about? Was it the grinding of the carb, just the mechanical grinding? Or was it the gastric emptying effect? That's, there was a lot of talk about that. Well, what happened was it was all due to the grinding of the carb. That's what made the badness. And the fiber was irrelevant. The fiber only acts as a proxy for non-processed foods to say that they're good. If you grind up these plant carbohydrates and you add fiber back in, it doesn't make them better, right? It's only a proxy. So a brief root cause diagram for all we've said. You've got excess fructose, excess glucose, refined carb. How does that drive blood clotting, endothelial damage, and heart disease and heart attacks? Well, I won't go through the detail like I did in Prague a few weeks ago, but trust me, the science is all in. True GIP, GLP-1, insulin, and myriad other effects that are all documented, you lead yourself into the insulin resistance syndrome that we mentioned a few minutes ago. That's the primary metabolic derangement that drives towards heart disease. But it's not a one-trick pony. There are many other problems like suboptimum magnesium or too much omega-6 vegetable oils, too little omega-3, that can independently have mechanisms to driving heart disease. But interestingly for me, many of these other bad things that drive heart disease also drive up hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. And that makes this insulin measurement and measurements around insulin so damn important, right? Because all of this big block can be identified through measuring insulin in a human. If you followed and went after these big Pareto items, very important ones, and took care of those, you'd be following the principle. You wouldn't be wasting your time with cholesterol and stuff. In fact, if you just focused on getting your insulin resistance right down, this big block here in the oval, that's the biggest hitter for heart disease. So if you just focused on getting that down, you'd be doing a kind of a super Pareto. I'm just going for the biggest thing that has the biggest bang. But ideally, you'll cover a lot more. So part four, primary solutions. And here we get into solutions, not in too much depth, but try and keep it simple. First cause, excess fructose, excess glucose, refined carb, which is glucose. What you do do is you eat low carb, high fat. That picture is from Diet Doctor in Sweden. Delicious food, delicious recipes. You don't deny yourself healthy, low-carb, healthy fat. What you don't do is eat breads, processed carbs, and all of this junk. And you don't eat processed foods in general, the cereals and all the processed foods. Most of them lead to the problems I mentioned. The mechanisms are insulin resistance, promoting hyperglycemia, inflammatory vectors, and many, many more mechanisms. The second thing that's obvious is omega-3, omega-6 ratio. You want to get your healthy omega-3s, you don't want too much omega-6. What you do do is you eat fatty fish, not too hard. Pure cod liver oil is very inexpensive for people who don't really eat so much fish. You get DHA, EPA, you get all the good stuff very cheaply. What you don't do is eat vegetable oils, for reasons I won't get into here, that's, that's just ridiculous. And you don't eat processed food, because that's kind of a given. Uh, it's full of vegetable oils and, and other problems. And the main mechanisms there are inflammatory vectors and cellular damage. So incorporate, incorporating these omegas into your cellular walls is not a good idea. It leads to instability and problems over time. Third one, suboptimum magnesium. I believe this is a very big one. 70, 80% of people are magnesium deficient. 
Uh, hypomagnesia is a huge issue. Magnesium is required in 300 plus reactions in the body. Having it low is a crazy thing to have low. You can eat Brazil nuts and other magnesium rich foods and you can get magnesium citrate in, by the pound bag. What myself and my wife do is we mix it with stews, with dinners, tasteless, all the family and the five children get magnesium without any hassle, any effort. And you don't eat processed food yet again. Sugars and processed food deplete you of magnesium, as does alcohol, so you just don't want to do that stuff. And this is biochemical basics, right? This is basic stuff. Last one, lack of UV exposure, vitamin D, nitric oxide. The sun is there for a reason. It brings huge health benefits. You want to get access to healthy sun, a UV lamp, if you can't get much sun, like in Ireland, <laughs> or vitamin D supplements or rich foods is a method, but it's ideal to get the UV because it creates more photo products in your body through your skin and more benefits. Don't burn. The only problem with the sun is burning, right? Going beyond erythema, a light pinkness, and getting burnt. That's what links to serious cancers. And uh, again, no processed food. Eating bad food is going to make you much more exposed to sun damage in any case. And you can move on down the Pareto, depending on your risk tolerance and your desire. How strong is your desire to live long and strong into old age, to be there for your grandchildren, to be healthy and walking around at 80 and robust, rather than kind of slobbering in a chair, right? It all depends on how much you want that. You can move down and fix a lot more things we don't have time to go into today. I didn't mention keto, and I'm at KetoCon. <laughs> it was a big big lapse. Keto is enormous artillery to help with many modern chronic conditions. Uh, some people may need keto for sure to get that extra mile, to get their insulin right down, right, to, to deal with, as lovely lady earlier talking about epilepsy is, is a huge example, and many other chronic diseases. Keto is major artillery to deal with those. That said, average people doing well on low-carb, healthy fat may not need to worry about keto so much. Uh, and another way to go keto is what I do, is I do a lot of fasting, often only one meal a day. So rather than eating sticks of butter or eating super fat stuff, I, I don't do that. I go low carb and then I cut all food for long periods to achieve keto. And I, I just think that's the best way for me. Bottom lines and your torture will be over. So part five, what's the bottom line here? If we get honest about it after years of research, what's the bottom line? If you're middle-aged, middle-risk, you're not sure of your health, you're not sure of the future, and you want to live long and strong, right? And have high vitality, not get a heart attack, not get a stroke, not get taken out. No-brainer, get a quick $100 calcium scan, five minutes, and you get your answer. What's your score? What's your damage to date? You get a low score, congratulations, you did something right. You're still going to want to check your bloods yearly, you know, and keep an eye out for there isn't a problem developing of some sort. You follow the rules and the Pareto list. You do the right things to keep that zero. And maybe five or seven years later, because you're healthy and you've got a zero in middle age, you check again. Make sure you haven't fallen off the wagon. You know, something hasn't gone wrong. Make sure you're still a zero or very low. You get a high score on that test. Different story. Now, you are now an engineer, and you have an engineering problem to resolve. No one's going to do it for you. No one did it for David. You're going to have to find out yourself, through many blood tests possibly, what is wrong in your life to have led you to get a high score at middle age. Now, if you were drinking Coke, sitting on your ass, watching television for the last 20 years, right, smoking the odd cigarette, there's no shock. Okay? You, can, you know where that zero came from. But what like David, if you were running a few times a week, super slim, health focused? Now he was eating a high carb diet that gave him diabetes, but what if you were fit? You'd have to know. Medications may be an option if you have a very high score with severe disease. Dr. Gerber uh, is not very pro-medications, uh, my co-author, but certainly in high score situations to stabilize plaque in the short term, it may be an option and it needs to be considered. You certainly want to follow the rules, but now you want to follow them really carefully, right? And keep an eye on your bloods. And you will want to move on down the Pareto. 
because there may be special causes for your situation that are not just the basic ones, high carb or lack of magnesium. And maybe two years later, you get a quick scan, you know, because you've taken action now to deal with, to deal with the problem. If you've got a 500 score, two years later, you want to verify it's still 550 or 540 or 480 if you're lucky, you know, that it has not increased. Because if the calcification does not increase notably over the years, your risk begins to plummet to someone who never had a score in the first place. And that's why there's so much hope here. You just need to stop the progression. And that's key. Moving on down the Pareto, there are special causes. Some people may need hard keto to get their insulin and glucagon and glucose metrics in a good place. They may need extra effort. There are APOE4 people. There's some information that APOE4 genotypes, if they've become diabetic through seed oils and sugars over the years, and they now have metabolic dysfunction, they may have a sensitivity to certain animal products, uh, fats and proteins in excess. So some people need to be careful in special ways. And heavy metals, you could have heavy metal contamination, need chelation or something, uh, may be a special cause that has happened in your case. I can't list them all, but if you've got a high score, you need to do the work to find out what it was. No one will do it for you. No one will do it for you. So if you did what I just said here, you'd be like an engineer and you'd be following Pareto, always going for the big bang, the most important factors, you know, where, where the value is, right? Spend your time wisely. If you, do that, if you did that, you'd be following Pareto. But what if you decided to follow the cholesterol route or follow the food pyramid with all those starches or, or eat those heart-healthy vegetable oils that we're all being told to eat or, or didn't get a calcium scan but said, I'll just go with the blood tests. They're good enough. What if you want to do that kind of stuff? Who would you be following? Well, I think we know, don't we? That guy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please make sure that you ask questions close to the mic. Thank you for that great presentation. I just had a quick question about insulin. Uh, should you check a fasting or postprandial? A fasting is very good and very valuable, particularly if you take a fasting with insulin with a fasting glucose and you put it in the HOMA uh, model. Uh, that will give you a value of be below 1 in HOMA, you're pretty good to go, even 1.2. 1 1.2 1 to 1.8 is a gray area, probably insulin resistant. Over 1.8, it's pretty sure. So I think for a lot of people in practical terms, a fasting insulin with a glucose is an easy way. If you want to do the better test postprandial, you drink the 75 grams of glucose, and two hours later, you get an insulin draw. And that gives you your two-hour insulin. And if that's below 30, you're good. If it's above 40, not good. In between, it's gray, and you could consider a five-hour full craft insulin assay, but that's going to be hard to get in the States. Mm -hmm. Though I believe Meridian Labs offer it by email. And, and they're in the States, so you could do the whole five hour with Meridian Labs. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so I'm not sure I followed all of that. So if I want, <laughs> if I want to get, uh, find out what my insul fasting insulin is, what's the best way to do that? Do I need to go to a lab t to have that done? Um, and, and what tests should I ask for? Should I do a glucose test or what? Uh, I would say, as per the last question, apparently no one gets given insulin tests in the States. That said, Dr. Ted Naiman, my buddy, says he can get an insulin for $38. Uh, he's in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So it probably depends on where you are, but going to a doctor and asking for a simple fasting insulin is the route. I guess, I guess you've got to pay the doctor for being there, and then in, in America you have to pay for the test. In Ireland you don't. It's free. So that's, you can get an insulin and you can get a glucose and get the HOMA. That's probably an easy way to get your initial data without getting into drinking glucose and all that stuff. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. The other question I had was, how do, I know, how do you know if, the, if your fat is healthy fat or sick fat? Ah, <laughs> well, the best thing is to get a biopsy, you know. And get <laughs> so yeah. I have lots of studies where they did biopsies and that's fantastic. But a serum adiponectin is a great test to get. So if your serum adiponectin is very low, you're almost certainly in good shape. 
on your fat cells. Uh, but the other things, uh, less direct, uh, and they were talked about by Dave and myself many times over the years, your triglyceride over HDL ratio, if that's very good, it's highly likely that your fat cells are in good shape. You know, if your insulin is low and your home is great, it's highly likely the fat cells are in good shape. But if you want to explore ad adiponectin and leptin, those two hormones, if you're low in leptin and high in adiponectin, my values are four in leptin, almost off the scale, and 20 in adiponectin, almost off the upper end. That's a great combination to have. Adiponectin is a fantastic measure. I don't know how available it is, and you'll be paying out of pocket, I guess, to get it. Okay, thank you. Right. Hey, Ivor. Um, just one, one quick question, a uh, comment regarding that last question. If you're in the U.S., directlabs.com, you can order your own fasting insulin test. Ah. I think it's 34 or $39. It's dirt cheap. Um, there's one or two states where it's not legal, but directlabs.com. Um, so my question is, you mentioned Gabor. Um, <laughs> I, I listen to the Break Nutrition podcast, and I am able to make sense of about 60% of what those guys say <laughs> on, on a good day. They, Gabor and, and Rafi Sert had a conversation once about fiber, and you had mentioned the fiber matrix in the carbohydrates. Um, mm. And I'm, I may be opening a can of worms here, but I'm, as a nutritionist who sees clients, I'm concerned about some of the products that I see, keto products that are low carb, high fat, loaded with fiber in the form of added cellulose, added, you know, um, corn fiber, whatever. What is your feeling on that? I feel like fiber, the way the gut handles fiber is different when it comes in the food matrix like broccoli or mushrooms or spinach or even a higher carb food like a parsnip or a sweet potato versus a keto bar or a keto li liquid shake that has fiber in it. Yeah, Amy, I, I, I'd agree. My cut, and there's no proof in this sphere, my cut is I get fiber from real foods. As soon as you separate out fiber and add it back in, you have the problem that, is it really going to give much benefit at all? I know you can feed gut microbiome and all this and make medium chain triglycerides from those guys. I, I know all the theories, but for me, I would stick to real food to get the fiber. And the interesting thing that Gabor elucidated was, you know, at the turn of the century, we ate uh, in the 1900s, a relatively high carb percentage. A bit like today, we're high carb percentage. And in the more the mid-century, we were lower carb and more nutrition, nutritionally dense foods and, you know, after the war, good meats, proteins. So we were kind of lower carb. But the people back who were high carb were not all sick and diabetic. Uh, and his point is that those foods uh, acted relatively beneficially through the gut, as I described. And that's why they, those guys were okay. Now the... If you track fiber, however, you see the picture. The fiber was very high in those foods at the turn of the century. The fiber has come right down now in the era of processing, right? So now we're at the same carbohydrate level as way back when people could handle it, but the key is the fiber's down. And the fiber is just a proxy for the processing. It's really just a proxy. If you take the fiber now that's low, and you put it back in, in, in forms like you say, and get us back up to the same fiber, it's not gonna help anyone. It's not gonna bring you back to 1900. It's not the fiber. Fiber's just good to track because low fiber foods generally means they were highly processed. And it's the processing that's done the damage. And I just, I think that mm. the net carb concept gets people into trouble because some mm. people I think are more sensitive to the added quote unquote fake fibers. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't do them. And I think Ron Rosedale said as well, fiber of, of that nature basically just does nothing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Ever. I was just wondering, in the studies you were looking at where they were looking at people with hyperinsulin uh, states, hmm. was there kind of a level that they were using rel relatively consistently where they considered someone hyperinsulinemic versus regular? Oh, the one I mentioned where insulin came up, as like 6.7 risk factor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in that one, I can't actually, I only got that very recently and I went through it to get the figures out. I didn't dig too deep. Uh, but what they were looking at really was per standard deviation of insulin. So they weren't really looking for a threshold effect. They were looking for a general continuous variable risk multiplier. So I'd have to go back and check as to where you could call it threshold. 
but in the nature of the case control study of who had heart attacks or who didn't, it was just looking at insulin as a predictor, as a continuous variable. But I could okay. go back and check at what threshold was the most significance. I'm guessing it'd be, you know, once you start going above five in fasting insulin, you're heading into territories unknown. And above 10, then you're well out there. Okay, thank you. I think. Thank you for your presentation. Toward the end of it, you had the low road and the high road for the CAC, yeah. and as you were closing out, you said that if you're on the high road, able to maintain the CAC, that the risk starts to decrease with time. Could you say a little bit about possible mechanisms, speculate? Yeah, well, the mechanisms are actually not too complex to describe. So when you develop uh, atherosclerosis in the early stages, the arterial wall becomes inflamed and it begins to build up thickness and you get crud in there, you know, macrophage and, and foam cells. Uh, at a certain point, your body senses this insult to the injury and begins to recruit in calcium to strengthen that area. So it's actually quite clever evolutionary. Uh, and it is the same process as bone formation. It's not like random calcium ends up in the wrong place. It is recruited through a whole series of very special processes to bring in calcium and strengthen the artery, right? So that's what happens. So if you're a guy who has no calcium, you never had the inflammatory disease that required patching up. And that's why you have such low risk. You're, you're clean. If you're a guy with really high calcium, you had a lot of disease, and you've got calcium all over the places shoring up your arteries. But what gives you the heart attack is when one, one of those plaque ruptures. So if you keep doing the inflammatory processes you've been doing and the calcium keeps building up and up and up, you'll hit the wall. And there are even papers that show there's an acceleration of atherosclerosis in the final six months before a big fatal event, mm -hmm. right? It's an exponential, you're rising, rising, oh, rising nice. to your death. Now, if you, however, change your life and you stop the inflammation, the calcium will slow down and stop accruing. And if you can see that happening over a couple of years, that the calcium stopped, well then the disease process has been essentially stopped. And if you stop the disease process, the plaques will all gently stabilize and your likelihood of bursting one goes down to, in some papers almost, to someone who never had them in the first place. That's just the way it is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have further questions, Ivor Cummins will be over here on the side. A round of applause for Ivor Cummins, please. <laughs>